Hello and welcome to TidyX40 Rerecord. Okay, so uh, so I made a mistake earlier this week uh, when we recorded episode 40 and somehow Pat's audio didn't get recorded during this. So we wanted to give this code its due and re-record it so you could hear what Patrick was thinking while we were going through it. Because I know you could hear me and I sounded like an absolute madman. Just well, kind of like going the off. The verdict is still out though. The verdict is, <laughs> is still out as to whether... Not hearing me is a good or bad thing. Maybe uh, we need a Twitter poll. Yeah, on, I don't know. On, um, People comment tidy below if unders- you like it. You tidy can... underscore explain. We need a Twitter poll <laughs> no as hat. to uh, yeah, whether it's worth having me speak. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure it's incredibly valuable when you zoom in. So we're going to go through the code again um, and get Patrick's thoughts this time as opposed to just mine. And hopefully uh, you'll like it and you'll uh, retweet this, share this. Uh, like it put comments down below love hearing from you guys we saw some great comments in the last video hopefully we'll get some great ones on this one as well uh, so let's get going so the code this week uh, as it was in the last video is from Jackie Torres uh, it's using the BBC 100 inspirational women of 2020 data set uh, from tidy Tuesday so uh, once again all around uh, fantastic topics right here so Jackie is using the tidy template from the tidy Tuesday R package you can see here um, first thing is she's loading in the library chunks and so we've got the setting of the uh, chunk options so it won't will be echoing the code if you're loading in tidyverse tidy Tuesday R plotly for making the interactive sunburst chart um, and then HTML widgets, and this is for saving the widget so you can share it out to uh, your adoring fans. <laughs> so let's run that. I always, I always jump through this and forget to run it. Alrighty, so brings in, uh, Jackie brings in the uh, weekly data using TT load from Tidy Tuesday R, using the um, formatted date there. So bring that in, pulling out the woman data set out of the TT object. Uh, and now building up the, um, this is like the first level of the sunburst, right? Pat, that's what, that's what we're, when we're going through and talking about it. So these are a bunch of vectors that are saying, this is the label, this is the number of values that exist under this, this level here. There are no parents to these. This is gonna be the top level of the sunburst. So parents yeah. are, are all- For empty. anybody who didn't see the first, uh, the first version of this episode, the sunburst plot is essentially an interactive plot. It, it basically looks like a pie and you have an option of clicking on one slice of the pie, which then essentially fans out and shows you a bottom layer of the ply with pie with the details that were within that kind of parent level or top level slice. Exactly. And so... These don't have any parents. They're the top level, so parents They're are all the top empty. level, yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, setting IDs to be the, the basically the same as labels at this point here. Um, then just, you know, creating some description, setting the colors, and then concatenating it all into a data frame. So run this here. We had some we had some discussions on using tribbles uh, as mm. opposed to this. Uh, quickly, it's tr. It's from the tibble package tribble, and so you can set, kind of set it up. So call one. So it's just a little bit more readable, I find, than trying to use these vectors here. Um, call three, just because like visually you can set it up how you'd actually be reading it. And so this is like column one, and then <laughs> two point, uh, um, and then two, another string, and let's do a rational number of five. And so now when you run this, it'll create the tibble like, it, like, like you see it, right? So it's gonna have three columns here. I mean, you could format it like that and it'll still parse it correctly. But if you put it like this, where each row is actually a row of your data, I find it's a lot easier to look, look at and read. And we do have an example in the next piece here. Yep. Okay, so Pat, you wanna take us through this piece? Yeah, and now um, Jackie goes through and preps. So the the first piece was uh, prepping data frame one, which was that top level. And now we're prepping into uh, data frame two, where she's using the actual Tidy Tuesday data, the women data. And she starts out with a little bit of renaming 
um, naming the uh, labels to be the name, the parents to be category. That's going to come in handy when she R binds in the next step. She just wants to make sure column names um, uh, line up so that there's something to bind things together to. Um, she does a little bit of uh, uh, mutating here. Uh, these things here are for um, uh, information regarding the, the parent level data, right? So the ID, um, she's pasting parents with a, a hyphen to the actual labels that she uh, created. So that's the category and the label name, pasting those together. And then she's setting some constant value, values uh, repeating a one across the, or, or down the entire uh, data set. I, I don't know. Um, I can't remember where she's going to use that, but it's there and she'll use it somehow. We'll see. We'll see. I can't recall. Um, and then uh, mutate. So she's adding a column and this column is specific to the colors. So um, this is, uh, again, some information that's going to be utilized to essentially stylize her plot. She's just building it right into the data frame. So she's setting the specific hex color that she wants for the uh, respective parent label and she's doing that with a case when so for example if it's you know going through data frame two or the women's data set when it sees parents equal all it's going to set it to that specific uh, hex code right there exactly. and then and then the select is she's uh, selecting I, I believe that's all the columns in the data set Maybe I not. Think it's she's subsetting it down. She might be subsetting it, or she's ordering it. If nothing else, uh, it might be ordering. Yeah. Yeah, I think she's. Yeah. She's yeah, reordering. she's reordering it, and I think this is going to help her with her R bind, which is in the next step. So now she's doing an R bind. You could have done um, uh, bind underscore rows. Either way, it's going to get you the same result. Uh, R bind is is from base R. Bind rows is the tidy verse. Um, tidyverse function does the same thing doesn't matter right yep. uh, and then the next step here so she's got her new data set it's called women two uh, she's going to break up the long descriptive label for the sunburst chart hover over text so here she's doing the uh, string r string wrap this is a cool function we talked about it maybe in the last episode maybe two episodes ago i can't recall um, but this is a really awesome function where basically you pass the str underscore wrap function, the uh, string variable that you're interested in, and then you specify the width. And so anytime it reaches that width number, so in this case, 100 character values, it's going to input an automatic uh, line break for you. Mm -hmm. And it's to help it like look prettier when you're when you're actually printing it out. Otherwise, yeah. it's going to try to make your HTML go out into the sunset. Yeah, you you end up with a just a massive long sentence or really long titles and things like that. So exactly. <clears throat> so now she's got this woman two data set which has everything in it. Just want to make sure that I've got the ram that there. So now now she's done all. She's finished all the data manipulation that she needs to be doing, and now she's going to be generating the actual plotly that you can actually interact with, click on, zoom in to see more about the uh, specific person and, and the, the label and, and whatnot there. So first she starts off with Plotly. She passes the woman two data set there. So the, so there's a couple different things that are kind of going on here at once where usually it might be split out. If you're like using ggplot, they'd be kind of split out into different layers, but Plotly, because it's based on uh, JavaScript and whatnot, you it's, you just kind of throw a bunch of information in there. At least that's what it feels like to me. And then you kind of build up the layers afterwards. So uh, plot leads are passing in the data here. You're saying, okay, the IDs, um, use the IDs column. Labels, use the labels column. So IDs, use the labels column. So tilde and the column name. Labels, same idea. Parents, same idea. And the type is sunburst. And so these are all information that the plot type she's creating, which is sunburst, requires in order to create the actual plot that we're trying to trying to show, right? Right. Um, and then she's going to set the inside text orientation to radial. That way, the text, as you look at um, at the plot, it'll be radial. So it'll kind of go with the arc of it. Yeah, sort of like fans out. around. Otherwise, it'll just be horizontal, and it's just yeah. kind of like... Ugh. Yeah, kind of hard to read. This piece here is cool. You want to kind of take us through this, Pat? 
Yeah, this is, uh, if you've ever used anything like Power BI or something, they have that awesome like tool tip where you kind of hover over things and get information. And it's a great way to add info and context into your plot without making it like super messy and putting a bunch of labels and annotations on there. So she uses the hover template uh, argument here to create the, um, uh, the tool tip that she wants. So when we hover over something on her plot, we're going to get this uh, sort of group of information that she glues together. And she's using, using a little bit of HTML here. So the, the B's are there for bolding. She wants it to be bolded. And then the BR is just telling um, the code that she wants a break there. So she basically is going to have, what is that? One, two, three, four lines. Looks like four lines of data uh, or information rather within her tool tip. So she's got women too, and the actual labels. Um, she's got the country. She's got the role of the individual. And then the description, uh, which is kind of like that short little two sentence or so paragraph that kind of tells you about um, the person or, or what they've done for this year. And, um, and so it's going to be a cool tool tip. And then she finishes with marker uh, uh, list equals colors equals and then she's going to actually use the column colors so that's why it gets that little tilde it's it's a little um uh if it's your first time reading something this might be a little confusing colors is the actual argument and also it happens to be the name of the column which is why it gets the tilde if the name of the column was banana it would be colors equal tilde banana which could also be totally be fine legit. It's yeah. just a little bit harder for somebody to come into your code to understand it, which is why you want to use reasonable names. Exactly. <laughs> no, don't use don't use banana. See, they should have you should have left my audio off. Yeah, it's a bad I, habit. I, I had a friend who told me once she had a um, she had a friend that was using a banana function or something like that. She wrote a whole algorithm based on this banana algorithm, and she named literally every variable banana. So it's banana sounds one, like it. banana two, banana forty two, banana. And, Horrible idea. And she was presenting it, and it failed. It broke. And she, oh, jeez. And so she had to go into her code with all these bananas. Wh which here. banana did it fail in? Exactly. So that's exactly. why I always give reasonable names. Um, all right. Finishes. And then, yeah, on. finishes up with just some, um, you know, just like you would do in ggplot uh, labs for your labels. She does the same thing here. She gives it a title. And she has the text with some, again, some HTML. And then the layout is literally, if we were to do in ggplot theme, you know, panel background, plot background, um, that's exactly what she's specifying a specific, it's kind of, kind of, kind of be like this greenish uh, type of color. And so this is cool. Plotly is a really powerful package in whatever we've got there, 103 minus 90 or, or it's like something like 15, that, lines. you know, 15, 16 lines of code. We have this amazing uh, interactive plot, which if we uh, zoom, yeah, maybe zoom will work. And literally it's totally, so there's, there's the tool tip. Um, so you can hover over a person. So that's, uh, and then out, yeah, there you go. So there, and then, and then if you wanted to go into the knowledge data, now we get, we can again, use the tooltip. The people are kind of blowing up a little further. You could move this into maybe even like one more, if you had information, perhaps more information about their lives, like you could Wikipedia, a short little bio about all these people and they could, you could click and get a little bio on them and things mm -hmm. about their lives and, and all the, all the things that they've done, the great things that they've done outside of 2020, if you wanted <laughs> pre 2020, right? Yeah, exactly. Like all kinds there's, of, all there's kinds no of limit. Things. This is, you're, you're building on HTML here, which is a very yeah. flexible language that you can, you can create so much interactivity with JavaScript, yeah. HTML, CSS, really, really great visualization. And, and that's also the, the blessing is the curse with Plotly. So, you know, ggplot is amazing and you can do tons of stuff. We use it all the time in pretty much all of our, um, we've used Plotly, I think once or twice. I might have in the, whatever episode we did statistical plotting, I used mm -hmm. a bunch of original Plotly code for that. Other than that, we use ggplotly to basically wrap our ggplots and get a quick and dirty um, interactive. Uh, but exactly. Plotly might... Yeah, Plotly might be something that we delve into a little bit further. It's kind of fun. Uh, but like I said, the blessing is the curse. Because it is so malleable, um, there's going to be a little bit more learning curve on the coding side. So exactly. that's the only. 
Yeah, the only thing. Yeah, POSNEG, right? If it's super easy to use, sometimes there's limited functionality. Ggplot somehow rides that line of yeah. being like very flexible but having great defaults so mm -hmm. that you can usually get by without having to do a whole bunch yeah. uh, with that. But Plotly super cool. The other thing about Plotly is if you are into building shiny apps, there is an output Plotly, and then a in the in the in the uh, server is a render underscore Plotly, and so you can actually get a chart just like this uh, within your shiny app, which it adds just a whole nother kind of dimension to plotting data, visualizing data, providing users with a, an experience of interacting with the data that's pretty unique. So. Exactly. And that mm -hmm. and also supports crosstalk, I believe, which means you could do yep. something in your plot and then have something show up in a table, which is also super cool. Uh, I'd love to do that in the future if we get a chance. Yeah, we should probably delve more into Plali. It lends its stuff really well to kind of cool um, sports I feel like we haven't done any hockey and we just got a hockey team in Seattle. So I think, I think we're due mm -hmm. to like build some hockey stuff. Yeah, I think so. You hear yeah. That? You hear that Seattle Kraken? Yeah. We're coming for you. Yeah. All right. <laughs> cool. So, but yes, that, that data set and that, or excuse me, this visualization from Jackie Torres. Thank you so yeah. much for letting us go through your code a second time uh, yeah. <laughs> and explain how all this worked. Uh, really awesome, really, really clean and easy to read. Yeah, cool. exactly. So thank you so much. All right, so now we're going to hop over to the code that we went through on using Plotly within APIs. So let me just quickly restart my R session. So, sorry. Oh, Here we go. There we go. Just just needed a Momo. All righty. Let me, don't save my edits to her. Her code's great. All right, so... The data that we pulled out this week to also work a little bit more with Plotly with, with is from the baseballsavant.mlb.com and their API that they've got going on over there. And so very high level API is basically somebody else's server sitting there. If I go to a specific URL and have the uh, URL formatted in a specific way, it will give me a response. Um, and so that's kind of high level what's going on. There's a lot more inter or like low level stuff that you need to know to really get good at it. I'm not particularly great at uh, working with APIs. Basically, I kind of lunge around and kind of try to do things. I look at the way other people have done things to try to figure this out. But the, really the key thing here is I, I build up my, my URL here. Uh, I, I found this by scraping through and reading through Baseball Savant's website. Um, you, you use the uh, inspector uh, inspect element for that, yeah. which we've done before when we mm -hmm. when we've um, pulled data from uh, baseball reference and basketball reference dot com. Um, those are rather simple tables and they're packaged in a nice and canned way that we can use our vest to pull the HTML. The JSON is basically storing much larger data. It's a bit more complicated on the back end, much, um, more much more complicated on the back end. So it requires a bit more to kind of get off the ground and, and access the data. I will say this website is amazing. There is tons of data there. And if, if, if you don't want to scrape the API, like you can kind of get the data you want and click write CSV and they pretty much give you a lot of access to a lot of data. So, yeah. um, yeah, it's pretty yeah. sweet. But yeah. yeah. So I wanted, uh, but I wanted to do an API design. I wanted to do this to have a little bit of fun with that. So build up the URL here. I use this get argument from HTTR or function from HTTR, which is get me this information. Uh, so it sends a request to the API, sends a response back, and that's now saved in res. I then pull out the content, which is usually saved as a raw, which is kind of a strange argument for a lot of our users, um, but really. Which, at least the way that I handle it is I do raw to car, raw to char. Usually that converts it into a character value. Uh, and I know it's going to be a JSON. And so I use the JSON light package and tell it to parse the JSON with the parse underscore JSON function and simplify it for me because I don't want to. It, it'll, by default, I think, say it as like a nest or uh, a list. And yeah. A bunch of list subcomponents to that. And if yeah. parse like, JSON, like the Like the one we did from um... Ben Baldwin. Sports, uh, sports, sports radar, radar. Yeah, yeah, Ben Baldwin's, yeah. Exactly, where it's a bunch so of So those like a whole bunch of lists, yeah. Yeah, and so I like to use a simplify vector equals true, 
and it just simplifies it if it can be, if it can turn it into a data frame it will uh, so stuff like that so so we've got that HTTR JSON light to deal with the JSON Tidyverse and Plotly to then do our uh, stuff that we're trying to do specifically for for this episode so this is the get batter JSON so this is going to reach out to the baseball savant website and get me information about the batter but what it needs is a UID, so a, a user ID, so the ID of a, of a player in the year that we want from it. Well, by default, I don't know the, the user ID. And so <laughs> there, there's, uh, they've got another API where you can send a name to it and it'll return to you the uh, user or the, the player ID, essentially. And so this is getting a little complicated, but if, if I pass a name to it, um, and it's got a space. So say I want uh, Will Smith. So it'll parse. It, it needs to format in a specific way for the query, which is the request I'm sending to the API. So it's going to first split it on the space. So then I'll have two objects, Will and or two entries in a vector, Will and Smith. Mm -hmm. uh, then I need to reverse their order, which is what this rev is doing here. Uh, for the HTML name search argument, I need to be putting it so it's last name, comma, 20% first name. And 20% is in HTML or URL speak a space. So that, that's kind of a funny thing to do there. And then for the name query part of the thing I'm sending to the API, they just want it to be um, name, HTML encoding for a comma, HTML encoding for a space, first name. So it's kind of complicated. So rather than trying to do that and figure out how to do that on my own, there's a function in base R called URL encode that'll convert that all for me. So I don't gotta actually do anything about that. All I do is say, hey, base R, convert this into a nice URL. Same idea as before. It'll then send a query off to the API, get me a result in the JSON, parse it up, and I get this player list. But sometimes multiple players have the same name. So I've got some logic here going, okay, if it returns an object or a, an object that I'm expecting it to, or if it doesn't return a player at all, go, eh, didn't find anything. If it's in a format that I didn't expect it in, go, this was unexpected, throw an error. Uh, but then if it does return multiple players, it's going to go through and prompt me to tell, ask me, which player did you mean? There's two players by the name of Alex Smith. It's got U UID 669453 or... Four, five, nine, one. I don't know. Um, which one do you want? And so I've set this up so that it will cat out what player it is, or the players, and their UID, and then a numeric index that I can enter. So then I call this read line here so that when I enter that number, it goes, oh, you entered a number. Is it one of the numbers of the players? Yes, no. If it is, awesome sauce. I'll use that one. If it's not, it'll re-request that uh, I enter a number in. So I'll, I'll show you kind of what that looks like in a second. And then it returns the user ID. Um, this is just a, a U, is UID is going to make sure that it's uh, a numeric value that is a user ID. So I'm kind of just jumping through this because this isn't really the point of this video. Maybe it needs to be the point of its own video. <laughs> yeah, we can definitely spend a lot of time. Yeah, we did get a res uh, request to do more about API design. I'm going to try to find a simpler example for API design or API yeah. interaction with this. Yeah. So yeah. basically what I'll do is I have this master function pull batter data. If I enter a name, it'll then query the API and go, this is the name you entered. Is this a real name? If it is, it'll then try to identify the UID for the player. It'll then go pull out the, the, the player's batting information for me and it'll then return a list of the player's demographic information and the player's uh, batting play-by-play -play information. If it isn't, it gets mad at me and doesn't run. <laughs> so let's run all that for us. There is one last function here, this pitch classifier. So Pat, you want to take us through this one? Yeah, so this is the um, uh, basically the way that you're trying to classify the different uh, uh, pitch options into um, you have a description, but you're trying to classify them into like more broader groups, essentially. 
sometimes with things like this, you can have lots of um, bins of things that are similar. So it's, it's helpful sometimes to bring them together. So you have the, um, the classifier match argument classifier, which is the, uh, the group and the description. So you're matching the argument between the two, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that, and that's input into the function. And then you're creating this pitch key, and here's the triple that you uh, uh, used before. So you've got three columns. You have a pitch type, a pitch description, and a pitch group. And so you're just going to build that little table. And then you get down here, and you basically do sort of like in Excel, like a VLOOKUP, where you're basically trying to identify or uh, set the names or match the names between the um, pitch classifier and the pitch type, right? Where is it? Oops. Pitch, pitch underscore class underscore classifier. Sorry. Yeah, you're yeah. pasting those together. Mm -hmm. And then return. And then you're returning the result. And okay. that function is done. And now you're ready to see about Will Smith. And we see that Will Smith is potentially two different players. So we have an option of whether you want uh, a player 669257 or player 519293. So you can go ahead and pick a random number. It's going to say, nope, that doesn't work. Um, you need to pick one of these two guys. Yeah. Now, and so now you pick one, and that gives us a battered data data frame of our guy, Will Smith. And so there's the string. And so we can kind of see the structure of the uh, STR gives us the structure of the data that you pulled in. So it's a list of two. We have a batter data frame, which has the play ID, the position, the name of the player. Um, and then we have some uh, oh, play by play data, right? And so this is where we get like the X and Y coordinates of the pitch, the V, uh, the Z coordinates of the pitch. Um, information about the fielders, information about the season, the game year, the count. Uh, I, we get an information about whether it was hit or not, the location. It's a pretty rich and long data set. I think there's even pitcher information in there, who was the pitcher, all those kinds yes, of things. Yes, in, it's insanely rich. I do look forward to looking through this data more. Um, let's see, you know, just a dim. So this is just one player. Yeah, for there's one like, season, right? One season. He has eight. Yeah. Rows. So that's. So I wonder if he's like an everyday. I wonder if like you put in a player who's like an everyday player, how many pitches he would have seen, like a Mike Trout, right? Like I wonder how many uh, pitches he would have seen. Uh, it's gonna probably it's probably gonna chug for a bit because I'm assuming he's a bigger. Oh, there we go. He's got more data. There we go. Better than two. Yeah, two. You know, great, great object names. Yeah. See, there you go. Yeah, two. So he saw uh, nearly twenty five hundred so. uh, pitches because that's every single pitch, every pitch, whether he hit it, whether it was a ball or strike or he foul tipped it, any of that stuff. Mm -hmm. um, so that's right there. Yeah, and one hundred and sixty nine columns of data. Yeah, so it's a pretty big. The same across all of them. Yeah. yeah. Really rich. Really, really in depth. So, but what I wanted to do was show you how you could use Plotly to kind of visualize some of this data. Some of this data. I was inspired by Baseball Savant's pitch um, viewer. So what we're going to do here is we're going to take the batter data. We're going to pluck out the play-by-play -play element out of that list. We're going to add in the group and description information so we can use that for uh, the plotting later on to add to the tooltip. So we have this P by P or PBP extra, the play-by-play -play extra data set, and then we go and create a very, very simple plotly, just to kind of show you maybe, like, this is equivalent to you just throwing it into a ggplot2 or a ggplot geom point, right? Yeah. This is yeah, the right. same level of that as that, but this already has a lot more interactivity. So what you do is you take the plot underscore ly function there from plotly, and then you add trace. So add trace is kind of very similar to like annotate or um, geome underscore whatever. 
uh, this 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 way here you add a trace so add trace mode markers so markers is equivalent to points uh, you're gonna use the data PPP extra the x-axis is the plate X but we're gonna convert it convert it to numeric because by default right now it's a character value <laughs> same with plate Z so I thought it was a little bit strange when I was going through this the x-axis is the X that you kind of expect but Z is what the vertical axis is. It's not one, yeah. which, I, which confused me a little yeah, bit. Yeah, Z, Z is working against gravity. So it's showing you the drop of the pitch as it's yeah. coming out. So this is what your most basic geo yeah. point version of Plotly, the, the markers. And, and it gives you, it gives you uh, a point plot, and it does give you some interactivity. You see that it gives you a basic tool tip, which is to return the X and Y. And then, and, and then just as Ellis did, you can click and hold the mouse and, uh, and zoom into specific regions. So, you know, there's some basic functionality that it has to it. It's not, uh, it's not horrible, but we can certainly nicen it up. Yep, and that's what we're gonna do here. Do you wanna take us through this one? Yep, so we're back with our Plotly function to start and then we're uh, piping in some information. The layout piece here is uh, essentially just stylizing some of the plot that he um, uh, that he wants sitting over top of these uh, these points, right? The pictures. So he's going to give the uh, uh, layout function. He's going to pass it uh, shapes, and it's uh, you're going to pass it a list within that. And and th these types, <laughs> what I never so plotly, nice yeah, plotly and data table. They do the same thing where it's like, oh, you're going to do options equal list equals list equals. You just keep going, but within that list, um, uh, as he said, he, he wants to he in his notes there plot a strike box. So obviously, it's going to be a rectangle, and he's going to provide a color that he wants, which is uh, hashtag. E I think is gray. <laughs> is it gray? Was it gray? I think it was gray. Yeah, it's a lighter and, gray. Yeah, lighter gray. Okay, and then the um, the line is the obviously the line outside uh, uh, surrounding the, the box. And then he's just giving it the X and the Y of exactly where he wants to uh, place that box, which um, he did in kind of an intuitive way. We didn't really know where the box was going to be, but uh, he kind of, uh, as he said, this was inspired by their website. So he went on there and he picked Will Smith and he, picked a pitch that was not very um uh that will smith didn't see very much of so he could exactly see the x and y coordinates and then he just sort of you know uh fudged his way around until he got a box on the plot that looked relatively similar to the one that will smith had and that's what we went with and then the opacity uh, that's just like uh alpha in in uh, ggplot2 so it's literally the uh the same thing we're making it a little bit clear yeah so so you have a reference oh. i showed this in the last recording there it is yeah so see this is just like i can't i can't i can't see what's going on here like but what i did yeah. let me change it to 2019 so that it matches our data set what i did is i filtered it down to keep was it breaking no uh, no something less than that uh change up there you go change up yeah because then there's this one dot here that is more or less on the the corner of this guy here, so I know the how far out this has got to go. Then we've got this dot over here, which is more or less on the. So it was, it, it was a it, it, estimation. Yeah, you so, you're sorting it out. It's it's an estimation. That's a good way to. Yeah, uh, you know, not everything can be perfect. Thankfully, I was able to do this and yeah. get a good idea of, of what it looked like here. So I filtered down my plot and and built that and M moved it around. Yeah, keep the same ones. Uh, so it Looks yeah. Insane. And then he's, he's got, uh, so just like before, just like the above plot, now we're into the add trace where we're trying to plop the points onto this. So, um, the mode is not going to change. It's still the markers. Um, the data is not going to change and neither are the X and the Y. Uh, the rest of this is purely stylistic. So color, um, with tilde pitch type is basically telling Plotly, hey, I want you to color this by all the pitch types that this guy has seen um, in, in, when he's batted this year. And the, uh, the size of the uh, markers, I want those to be specific to release speed. Again, because it's coming in as that list, it's all in a character format from the JSON file. So you got to just convert it to numeric right there. So the size of the markers is going to change based on the speed. The symbol is going to change 
based on the pitch group. And remember with Plotly, we always have the tildes before each of the variables within our data set. And the symbols that he wants to explicitly use are X's and O's. And then uh, the next piece is our cool little tool tip. So he's got the um, um, text is going to equal uh, pitcher and the pitcher name, pitch, count, the speed, and the result. So whether the guy hit it or took a strike or took a ball or, or whatever that might be, he's got a little bit of uh, the BR there for the bolding um, in HTML. Our breaks, sorry, that's right, breaks. Bye. Yeah, new line. Yeah. And um, the hover info is basically just telling the uh, text that, hey, I want you to plot this out when I hover over, you know, any any one of the points. Mm. I also did this because if I don't use this, it'll try to it, see how it's showing the actual point that it's at. Yeah. I really don't want that. Or at least I didn't want it when I was plotting. Uh, Wait, what, do you, what do you mean you use? So oh, 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 yeah, you want it to say the text, right. That's why you built it explicitly. Text. I don't want it to show, like, all this, like that's why because you can't really negative 0. 0.44 2.86 that means yeah. really nothing to me that's right that is one thing about plotly uh is is that um it will i think it always will try and force the xy into your tooltip um so you if you don't want that just get it out of there with your own little text yes, exactly uh, and then, and then uh, the final piece is, uh, let's give it a title. So it's Will Smith, uh, UID, blah, 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 2019. Again, if we built this into a shiny, uh, we wouldn't need the title. We would select Will Smith. And um, I, although I don't know how we would handle the I, selecting the correct IDs in shiny, maybe that's something we could work through. But, yeah, definitely do that. Yeah. But um, now we have this awesome plot. And it has all of the typical, as you would expect, Plotly features. So you can zoom in, you can uh, hover over one point and get the information about that pitch. Or you can go over to the legend there and you can double click on any one of those and it'll give you just that one. So what was the one that you used to um, sort out the box? Change it. Change up? I don't, was it change up? I can't remember now. I don't know. Here, let me I, here. Let me open that up. Change up. Change up. I wonder, did I select the same player? Maybe it's maybe change you selected up. the wrong Will Smith. Oh no, change up is coded funny. Oh, because uh, right. you changed the descriptions. Well, yeah. Let's see you. I remember being like, "What is this? Let's find out what it is." A change up is C B. No, C, C, H. C, H. I was right. So it's that one. And so, as you can tell, I'm a little bit off on some of it. Um, let's, let's hover. Interesting. Let's put that one next to this one. So, I mean, I'm, I'm a skosh off on something. So, these were lined up when I, when I. Yeah, interesting. This. Pretty close. Uh, but I wonder why. Yeah, it's interesting. Yeah, it was lined up before, but this you can be up here. I like the one that's all the way by the two on the uh, Y axis. That's the one that he took right off. It looks like his uh, right leg, his right thigh. Yeah. How fast was that one going? 87 miles. So at least it wasn't too fast. Uh, foul, foul, ball, 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 ball. Hit into play. So you can also look into this too and like see where he likes to like I, I, I mean I just like this interactivity because then you can kind of see where yeah where he's and, interacting with the plot. And, and with the plot lead, there are other kind of um, if you hover over the plot itself in the upper right you'll see a bunch of like um, little tools pop up that oh I know are, why are also useful I didn't do my one. And this is an this is an error in in the last video too. So y'all get to see a fixed version of this. Oh, there, there it go. is. Boom. That's pretty good. There you go. Now you, you go. got now, it. Now it'll match it. Yeah. So the box a little bit larger now. So what was it? You had a Y. So I, when I had entered the code for the the box here. Yeah. It's x zero x one y zero. This I had y zero. Oh, okay. That's what it was. Yeah, there you go. Okay, there you go. cool. 
I love that. That's fixed. I'll push that update. See, that's what you get when you go through your old code. Yep. It's not even that old. But you find issues with what you did. Yeah, so that's that's a fun way to interact with it and kind of see more about that. Uh, let's turn back all the all the stuff. Everyone, yeah. Hit by pitch. Hit by pitch. So Austin Bryce hit Will Smith. Sam Coonrod hit Will oh, Smith. So- Wes Par- Parsons hit him. Who is the green dot there? Oh, Steven Strasburg. He's kind of a famous pitcher there. Mm-hmm. It was a one-two count, and he just uh, beamed him. Yeah. Maybe he didn't like his attitude in that game. To me, it's also interesting because you can really tell he's a he's a right-handed hitter. Yeah. With the distribution being yeah. like shifted over yeah. to, to the right here. Which we, we did do. Um, we did base, uh, baseball. We did basketball shot charts. We could do the same type of, like, geome density heat map and show um the di- show those distributions more explicitly as well you know same type of concept but that's pretty cool stuff but yeah. yeah so that is another run through and this time you heard pat you heard him let us know if you don't want to hear me anymore <laughs> <laughs> of, of how you can go through use apis use plotly to to visualize some some cool data and make some some nice tool tips yeah. along with that but cool. i think with that we're gonna we're gonna end it so you heard us talk again for another 40 minutes or so so <laughs> thank you very much for listening to us we really appreciate it we really appreciate any comments any likes any any messages you want to send us we love hearing from y'all um as always i guess we'll end it here my name is ellis hughes you can find me on twitter at, at ellis underscore hughes and I'm Patrick Ward. You can find me on Twitter at OSP Patrick, and you can find both of us on Twitter at tidy underscore explained. And you can email us with questions, comments, ideas, thoughts, uh, things you might like to see at tidy dot explained at gmail.com or uh, tag us on Twitter, leave a message or third option on the YouTube channel. Uh, just go ahead and drop a comment in and uh, we will, Try and answer that as well. All right. Well, thank you all so much for listening to us again. And keep on exploring your world.